Good morning, church. Good to worship with you this morning. We are glad you are here, and uh, we look forward to our time together. Um, I wanted to, I didn't have a chance to talk with you before the service, Rick, but is there an update that we can give the congregation as far as what we are looking at doing missionally for our school and uh, some of the families? So the update is that we have uh, two and, and possibly one or two others. Uh, the, the two are single moms with four children going back to school and we will be taking them shopping and getting their shoes and underwear and stuff like that for the school thing. So uh, just an update to inform you of, of what's going on and if, as others come forward we will uh, embrace that challenge as well and uh, be a part of that. Anything else that needs to be announced this morning? I invite you, if you would, just to take a moment, calm your hearts, calm your minds, cut off everything that's been going on prior to today, cut off everything that you're thinking about doing this coming week, and let's take and consecrate this hour of worship to the Lord our God, to what God wants to do in our hearts. So would you take just a moment of silence and prayer and uh, prepare yourselves for our worship. Amen. Join me in our call to worship. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation.
God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us continue now as we work through today's reading from Psalm 138. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down before your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted your name and your word above everything. On the day I called, you answered me you increased my strength of soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. They shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For, thou, though, for though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he perceives from far away. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve me against the wrath of my enemies. You stretch out your hand, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. The scriptures inform us that the trespasses were nailed to the cross when our Lord was crucified. The full payment for our sin was offered in the death of Jesus. When Jesus was raised from the dead, God gave evidence to all that sin's power over us has, has been broken and new eternal life has conquered death. Let us confess our sin in light of the cross and resurrection of Jesus, our risen King. God of love, in the wrong we have done, and in the good we have not done. We have sinned in ignorance. We've also sinned in weakness. And we've sinned through our own deliberate fault. We're truly sorry. We repent and turn to you. Forgive us and renew our lives through Jesus Christ our Lord. Create in us a clean heart, O oh God. Restore to us the joy of your salvation. God of love and justice. We long for peace within and peace without. We long for harmony in our families, for serenity in the midst of struggle. We long for the day when our homes will be a dwelling place for your love. And yet we confess that we are often anxious. We do not trust each other. We harbor violence. We're not willing to take the risks and make the sacrifice that love requires. Look upon us with kindness and grace. Rule in our homes and in all the world. Show us how to walk in your paths through the mercy of our Savior. Create in us a clean heart, O God. Restore to us the joy of your salvation. Holy God, we confess that we have not lived as you have taught us. We're so busy with our lives that we forget our very breath depends upon you. While we waste time on meaningless activities, we fail to recognize sometimes the moments of grace throughout our day. We're too busy to participate in a loving, honest relationship with you. We simply shut you out of so much of our lives. Breathe into us once again, O oh Lord, and renew us in your spirit and set things right within our hearts. Create in us a clean heart, O oh God. Restore to us the joy of your salvation. Let us take a moment now and offer our silent prayers of reflection and confession. Amen. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling and rises up all who are bowed down. 
Through Christ Jesus, by the grace of God, we are forgiven. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Take a few moments now and pass the peace with each other. Don't let us stop you. You're having so much fun out there. <laughs> I pray this will be a blessing to you as you worship. Continue to worship together.
And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I gotta, I gotta come back. I always, when I hear stuff like that, I always get lost in it, and I'm like, you know, trans, transported somewhere else. Have to figure out how to get back into reality. Probably, especially since I have to preach now. That would be a good thing. Would you bow your heads and let us pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the words of Scripture. Words written long ago. But words that still have power. Still inspired by the Spirit. Still bringing life. Still calling us to transformation. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to understand the things that you have for us today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our text today is found in Deuteronomy chapter 30. And I'm uh, going to read uh, a little bit of an expanded passage from what we had originally planned this morning. When all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse, which I've set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you. And you return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and you obey his voice in all that I command you today with all of your heart and with all of your soul. Then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes, and have compassion on you, he will gather you again from all of the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. If your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will take you. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land that your fathers possessed, <clears throat> that you may possess it. And he will make you more prosperous, more numerous than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul that you may live. And the Lord your God will put all of these curses on your foes and enemies who persecuted you. And you shall again obey the voice of the Lord and keep all of his commandments that I command you today. The Lord your God will make you abundantly prosperous in all of the work of your hand, in the fruit of your womb, and in the fruit of your cattle, and in the fruit of your ground. For the Lord your God will again take delight in prospering you as he took delight in prospering your fathers. And when you obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes which are written in this book of the law, when you turn to the Lord your God with all of your heart, and with all of your soul. For this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend to heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. This is the word of the Lord. Well, our journey through Deuteronomy this summer is almost at a close. Next week we will actually close our study out. I don't know of a simpler book, a more profound book in the Old Testament that pro pro uh, proclaims the gospel. It's an incredible book. It really, it really is. The front of the book where it opens and the end of the book give us the clues as to what the whole book is about. The book begins in chapter 1 with this statement. Behold, I have set before you the land. Now go in and possess it. And most of the body of the book ends with this word from the Lord. I've set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Choose life. The book begins with this thing. I've set before you this amazing promised land. Choose to go in. And I've set before you at the end of the book, blessing and curse and life and death. Choose life. 
That's what the book of Deuteronomy is about, choices. It is about the idea that God is always encouraging us, always moving in our lives, always directing us into a direction whereby we can enjoy his land, the abundant provision of God, and whereby we can enjoy the blessings and enjoy life. That's always God's overtone. When you, when you look at the passage we just read, it just oozes with this idea of when all these things happen, then you're going to go and you're going to possess and you're going to be blessed and you're going to inherit and you're going to see things that your fathers never saw and life is going to be good. Make no mistake about it. The bookends of Deuteronomy clearly state and reinforce God's disposition toward his people. But the book of Deuteronomy also shows our struggle to obtain the life that God desires for us. That's its beauty. It's really the beauty of the gospel. There's this amazing promise that comes to us in Christ and the gospel is about the struggle of people to understand that and to get with the program and to live with that. As we've shared with you before, the power of Deuteronomy is in the reality of life. You see, Deuteronomy presents to us some graphic pictures on two ends of the spectrum. Deuteronomy is a book about the promises of God. God has promised to bring his people out of the land of Egypt, and God has done that, and now God promises to bring his people into the land at the book, end of the book of Deuteronomy. They're going to go in and they're going to possess. There is this, on the one hand, the promise, and then there's on the other hand, the fulfillment to that promise. But the people are not yet in the fulfillment. They're still in the promise. It's been promised. They're being encouraged to go in and accept the promise and have it fulfilled in their life, but they're not there yet. That's kind of where life is. It's somewhere between the promise of what God has promised us in Christ Jesus through the cross and the fulfillment of that. When all things are made new and you and I have gone through the judgment and we receive our, re our resurrected bodies in a new heaven and a new earth where God has made all things new. We're not there yet. We still live in the promise. It's also this stage, as we've suggested, between memory and anticipation. Deuteronomy again and again calls God's people, remember. Remember what you were like as a people in the land of Egypt. Remember what it was like when you were slaves. Remember when God brought you out through signs and wonders. Remember that. Recall that. Live in that. Remember as God brought you through the Red Sea. Remember how God took care of you in the wilderness and you never lacked because the Lord your God was such a good God. Remember that. It's a life right now at this stage, at the end of the book of Deuteronomy. It is the memory of that and it is the anticipation of this land over here that flows with milk and honey. A land where things are good a land where there's a future for their families. I was thinking about this today. What must it have been like for a group of people who have just been through the wilderness? They've had all their needs met, but it's a day-by-day -day living experience with the living God. And now you're about ready to go into a land where there is abundance. I want you to think about it. They weren't people that had bank accounts. They weren't people with nest eggs. They weren't people with a retirement plan. They were people who were basically dependent day by day on God providing. And now they're about ready to go into this land, this anticipation of abundance that they could never even fathom. All their needs taken care of. But Deuteronomy is the space between the memories and the anticipation of what God might have for us. Deuteronomy is a book that exists between the already and the not yet. Already God has delivered, but not yet is there fulfillment to all of the promises. You see, all of those terms are just like our terms. They're just like what we understand with the gospel. 
There's the promises that God has made in Christ Jesus, and then there's the ultimate fulfillment of that, and we live in between. There is the memory of what God has done in our lives and how God has been with us, and there's the anticipation of what God is going to do with us in the future, and there is the already, there is what Christ has certainly done, and yet we don't see it in his fullness. Just like Deuteronomy, we live in between. We live in the space. I want to suggest to you this morning that it is only the promise, the power of the promise, the power of memory and the power of what is already as it maintains itself in us that keeps us and guides us and keeps alive the hope for the fulfillment, the anticipation, and the not yet. When we get discouraged, when we think it's never going to happen, when we question, is God really big enough and powerful enough to fix this mess that we see in our world? Is God really big enough and powerful enough to see me through the times that I'm facing and what's ahead? It's because we've forgotten. We've forgotten what God has promised, what God has already done in our memory, and what has already been accomplished. And when we lose sight of that, we struggle to maintain our vibrant faith. It is here between the two polar ends that we do life. It is here that God calls us to choose the theme of Deuteronomy. I've set before you this land, choose to go in. I've set before you life and death, choose life. Deuteronomy is a book about the in-between space of what was and what will be. And the what is, is a time where there are to be choices that are made. We live a life of choices. You and I live with choosing every day what we're going to do, how we're going to live, what God has to say about who we are and what we do. We're called to choose whether we're going to obey or not, or believe or not, or respond, or just ignore or be indifferent. There's really no more crucial time than the reality between the extremes of memory and anticipation. What's already and what's not yet. What is promise and what is fulfillment. It is that space today that occupies and calls us to a life of choices. It's an interesting thing within the text. This text, the Deuteronomy text, it is, it is understood by most all Bible scholars that it was actually put together from pieces of Moses' writings and Moses' stuff. It was actually put together in exile. It was written probably in the seventh century BC, somewhere in there. That's when it was formed and the scribes uh, edited everything. And you'll notice if you go through there and you have to do a real quick study of it, you'll notice that many of the laws that are recited are different than the laws given in Exodus and Numbers because they, they, they were written at a different point in time. There was a different sense in the writers. Still inspired, still the word of God, but it was written by this group who were on the other side of exile. They had experienced exile. They had experienced what God had put forth in the way of blessings and cursings. They had been a people who had known the blessings of God, but also a people who had known the curses. So the words in our text have a double meaning. Not only is it Moses preparing a people to go in, remembering their failures, but it is also a text that deals with people who many years later see their failures and now once again are called to go in. And so the text is very clear on what it's presenting. It says to us these words. It's amazing. If you think about these words and you realize how, how it struggles to make sense with just where Moses and the people are at prior to going into the land. The Bible says, when the blessings and the curses have come upon you, when you return from all of the nations to which I, the Lord, have scattered you, when you return to the Lord your God and God restores your fortunes, when the Lord brings you into the land that your fathers have already possessed, then you will prosper and multiply. In other words, it's written to a group of people who have seen and understood in their history there was a time in which God's people followed God and the blessings of God flowed. 
And there was a time when God's people failed to do that. And they were scattered all about. And God says, when I call you back, when I bring you back, when the blessings and curses have come upon you, God says, I will circumcise your hearts. It's a fancy word for conversion, transformation. You see, God told the people that prior to this, you had eyes that couldn't see. You had ears that couldn't hear. You had a heart that couldn't understand or didn't understand. You were a people who had broken your faith. But I'm going to give you a fresh beginning. You see, it was clear what Israel was supposed to see. They were supposed to see God's nature revealed in the wilderness and know that that God who protected and cared for them is now going to protect and care for them in the future. It was clear what they were to hear. They were to hear the resounding words of Sinai as God made covenant with them and to keep those words alive in their hearts and in their minds. It was clear what they were to understand with their hearts, what they were to know. And that is that they were called to be faithful in their devotion to God. But they didn't see, and they didn't hear, and they didn't understand. And now the words say, you now stand before me, all of you, everyone, men, women, children, aliens, elders, strangers, and people who are not even with you today but will follow you. There's a new covenant being made. It's a covenant at Moab. And for all of the failure that you've encountered, there is salvation that's coming. And those who follow you I'm going to wipe away your failure. Aren't you glad that God's power, God's grace, God's goodness can wipe away our failure? Isn't that an amazing thing? Just like that. It's gone. God is looking at this group of people who are battered and beaten living life in strange places. It says, in spite of all that you've done, in spite of the ears and the eyes and the hearts that didn't get it, I'm going to circumcise your heart. And you're going to see, and you're going to hear, and you're going to understand. And when you do, I'm going to bring you back into the land. And there, you're going to experience the goodness of salvation. That's the way God is. From the very beginning of the pages of Scripture, it is a story of God's goodness and how we as people mess that up and how God is God always comes and restores through His grace that which we do not deserve. That is the story of Deuteronomy. God says, when you come back, when the heart's been circumcised, when you see and when you hear and when you understand, when I bring you back into the land, then you will turn to the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul. I love that part of the text. God isn't saying, well, you're going to have a chance to. God is saying, listen, there's coming a time in which I'm going to do such a work that obedience is going to be not only possible, but it's going to be accomplished. Obedience and wholehearted devotion to God is going to be something that is achievable. God says to them, listen, it's not too far away. It's not way up in heaven that somebody has to come and uh, go and get it and bring it back. It's not way across the sea where somebody has to go over there and bring it back. No, the word is nigh you. It's in your mouth. It's achievable. It's something that can happen because I, the Lord your God, am going to do something. Our Lord did that when He gave us Jesus. The power of the new birth, 
the power to transform, the power of the Holy Spirit within us gives us the ability to be a people who follow God with all of our hearts and all of our souls. God says this obedience, it's not too hard. It's not too far off. It's reasonable. It's not complex. You don't have to have a PhD to understand the will of God. It's clearly seen. It's not mysterious. It's not muddled. It's not dark. Think about it. What is it about that God wants from you that's hard or is unseen or unclear? What is it about God, what God calls us to be as a people that is just too complicated to understand? Too muddled to really get a bead on or too mysterious to grab a hold of? It really comes down to a matter of do we want to or not? Do we want to obey God or don't we? And that, my friends, is not rocket science. It's not like we're sitting here going, oh my gosh, the will of God, you have to be, you know, in top physical shape or you have to be mentally a giant or, my goodness, you have to socially be outstanding. No, it's, it's pretty easy. Are we going to forgive the people that have wronged us and hurt us? That's pretty easy. It's just a choice. Are you going to hold on to it? Harbor it? Become re somebody who is bitter? Or do we just freely forgive? It's not, it's not rocket science. It's a matter of do we do it or not? Are we generous? Do we live open-handedly, or don't we? It's not hard. Do we take what we have, and do we look for opportunities to be a blessing? Not only to the church, but to the world around us. That's, that's not hard. It's a matter of want to. Worship. Be faithful to worship the Lord your God, to love the Lord your God, to, to offer yourselves to God. That's not real hard. It's just a matter of... Do we choose to do it, or don't we? Call to bless and to serve. To not be people who are isolated and individuals stuck over here and just living life for yourself, but to actually place your life out whereby the gifts and the callings and the talents of God can be used for other people. Moses said, I set before you life and death. Choose life. Choose to be a people of God who wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly embrace the things of God and say, we will live this way. It's crazy to me, words written long ago to a group of people who we have nothing in common with except the Lord our God. We're challenged to do the very things you and I are challenged to do. The difference is we now live on the other side of the cross. God has made it possible through the power of the cross to live that kind of life. What is it that we choose to do with that power? That is our question. Would you bow your heads? Almighty and loving God, we thank you for the gift of your word. We pray now for the grace to believe what we've heard, to live in ways that honor you above all. It is through Christ Jesus, our Lord, that we pray. Amen.
Amen. While you are standing, would you join with me and profess our common faith together in our Lord Jesus Christ. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, if our ushers would prepare themselves and wait on our people, we will receive our weekly offering. seated. This time we'll go before God with the prayers that are upon our hearts for those who we know and love. Perhaps you know people who are struggling, 
people who could use uh, the touch of God really in their lives, both in healing or, or in uh, some other area. Uh, we've also been asked this morning to be mindful of those uh, whose lives are greatly impacted and suffering because of the hurricane this morning. So let's go before our God. We'll create a space where you can present those names before the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are always encouraging us, always calling us to choose the life that you have for us, to choose the life of blessing to choose the life of God. We thank you that it is not hard. We thank you that you've not made it too complicated. We thank you that in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have received all that we need in the way of promises to see us through and to help us to navigate through life. Hold us, Lord God, in your hands until that which we anticipate, that which is not yet that which is the fulfillment of all that you want to do is realized in our lives. We turn our hearts, Father, toward our world, a broken world, a conflicted world, a world that experiences and knows chaos, a world that knows hatred, a world that knows strife, a world that is being rocked by power, by those who have agendas, by those who are concerned only for themselves. We pray, Father, for that world, for those who lead and guide those who govern. You command us to do so, that we may live quiet, peaceable lives. We pray, Father, for the communities that we live in, our community of faith, communities where we reside, those that we reside among. Help us, Lord, to be salt and light where you plant us. Keep us, Lord, with an eye towards heaven that we might be faithful witnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now, Lord God, we pray for those, especially who have been impacted by the hurricane, those who have been displaced from their homes, those who have lost so much, those who may be injured, those, Father, who are wondering what will we do tomorrow or the next day or next week. We pray for them. Pray for those helping them, encouraging them, those who are bringing aid and those who are helping to rebuild. We now lift before you those who are upon our hearts, people we know who are struggling, people who we know need a touch from God. We place them before your throne. As we place these names before you, we leave them into your care. Heavenly Father, touch these lives. Extend your grace and your mercy into them. Shower them with your love and compassion. Help them to know, Father, that the God of heaven is a God they can count on. Introduce them to your presence and to your spirit if they do not know you. Help them and be with them. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to pray these things. We pray especially this day for blessings upon the Everson family as they've shared and ministered with us. Lord, cause them to reap some of the benefits, the blessings, the blessings that they bring. We thank you for all of these things. We lift them up to you in the mighty name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
receive the blessing of the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine down upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you, grant you his peace. May we be a people who choose life. Go in peace, for we are. Amen. Amen.